This episode, I'm joined by ethics professor and Kierkegaard scholar Rua Fremstera. We discuss the work of Pieter Wessel Zapfer, Kierkegaard, and the topic of anti-natalism. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paying patrons and subscribers for making all this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast as it runs off patronage alone, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Rua Fremstedal. Thanks very much for joining us on Hermetic's podcast. We are going to be discussing the work of uh, Pieter Wessel Zapfer and alongside Kierkegaard as well, um, primarily from, once again, my own readings of The Last Messiah, which is one of the primary Zapfer texts, which is available in English. And then I've searched out as many of your own papers and your own work, uh, which you have a focus on Zapfian morality in relation to Kierkegaard uh, and a few papers around that, which were which were really great to read, especially for an English speaker interested in Zapfer. Um, so thanks very much for joining us on Amedics. And um, yeah, before we jump in, just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what it is you do and uh, why it is you... You write about Zapfer or wrote about Zapfer because you said it's been a it's been a little while. Yes, thank you and uh, thanks for having me. So basically, um, I'm at the moment a philosophy professor with lots of administrative duties and uh, yeah. So I, I'm publishing uh, on on Kierkegaard and existentialism in a broad sense, but and I actually got introduced to Zapfer when I was an undergraduate. So like many others, I found existentialism. <laughs> interesting and uh, we had a lot of courses on existentialism in a very wide sense including a lot of 19th century thinkers like Nietzsche and Kierkegaard <clears throat> and also we had courses on um, 19th century pessimism so uh, Schopenhauer and the people who provoked Nietzsche <clears throat> and in this connection uh, at least at Norwegian universities it felt uh, natural to introduce Sattva because Sattva himself um, described him as uh, a pessimist. And he obviously obviously meant pessimist in the old German sense, uh, roughly the view that uh, life is, is not good. There's, uh, it's it's uh, characterized by unhappiness rather than happiness. Um, <clears throat> so this is the view that's known from Schopenhauer. <clears throat> and and Sattva himself didn't really describe himself as a an existentialist. I don't even think he knew the 20th century existentialists until much later when he had basically developed his own theory. Mm. Yeah. Are you a pessimist? Would you consider yourself? Not really. So uh, I found the whole thing uh, thought-provoking. <clears throat> so it's, on the one hand, very appealing. Uh, many find it attractive and right, and, and there's a lot of uh, black humor, there's a lot of vivid descriptions and things that it's just so uh, appealing and strong. On the other hand, something seems very wrong about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I tried to figure out what is wrong, uh, why shouldn't we, we be pessimists? <clears throat> mm -hmm. And so uh, Sattva tends to provoke his readers. They tend to either sort of embrace his pessimism or just reject it flat out. <clears throat> uh, mm. Often they, they don't care to spell out in any great detail exactly why he's right or wrong. So some of the literature is not very helpful. <clears throat> well, um, before going forward into his ideas and also those of uh, Kierkegaard, I have to ask you the Hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? And... Uh, Zapfer is already waiting, sitting, waiting in the room. I, I think I'd start with Kant, actually. So uh, not the, the very boring Kant of uh, the groundworks and stuff <laughs> like that. More than the Kant that's interesting to hope and religious faith uh, and um, who's discussing theodicy and the problem of evil and stuff like that. <clears throat> that uh, more existential or proto-existential Kant. And of course, um, Kierkegaard. Uh, I'm a Kierkegaard scholar, and I think that Kierkegaard is one of the greatest 19th century thinkers, really. <laughs> um, and the last one, perhaps either either Nietzsche or uh, one of the contemporary pessimists, uh, perhaps. So, uh, Banatar or someone, yeah. Mm. yeah. 
Who do you th- who do you think would sort of lead that room? I mean, Kierkegaard, from from my understanding of his biography, he was quite energetic, but he was also quite a uh, a figure of solitude. So maybe no one would end up talking in that room. They'd all just be kind of miserable. <laughs> yeah. So often there's this problem of philosophers talking past each other and so <laughs> on. But uh, we do know uh, that. Um, well, Sapper wasn't well read in philosophy by today's standards. Mm-hmm. He did study philosophy at university only briefly. He didn't even have a, a BA or MA in philosophy, he just had a PhD. Uh, and this is possible because he had a law degree already. And then in the old university system, you could just submit <clears throat> a PhD in a new subject. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it sounds crazy, but uh, there is a, this is all continental system uh, that's still in place many places in Europe um, and so Sapo was pulled in different directions on the one hand he was very strongly influenced by a lot of literary writers and what we these days call continental philosophers he, he was influenced by Schopenhauer, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard <clears throat> on the other hand when he, he got to Oslo and started to do his PhD he got very st- strongly influenced by uh, logical positivism and the, the sort of analytic philosophy that was dominating in Oslo in those days. <clears throat> so particularly his friend, Professor uh, Arne Ness, beca- became very influential. <clears throat> and so this basically led Sattva to change his whole style. So um, if you read The Last Messiah, Mm-hmm. It's a literary work from 1933, so he basically states his view there fairly clearly. Uh, it's a very pessimistic position. But then later on, uh, in 1941, when he defends his uh, dissertation, his PhD dissertation, to a large extent, the subject matter is the same. He's still discussing um, uh, pes- pessimism, but... The style is very different, so it's more of an academic style, much more influenced by biology and the positive sciences, and especially by Arnes and the old-fashioned analytic philosophy. And also, he's not just stating his views, he's actually arguing for them and, and making them more... He's, he's making them a little bit weaker, and and he's he's retracting uh, some of the more extreme statements mm. he made. Actually, um, yeah. Would you say he becomes sort of less romantic? So the, you know, when no, I read... it's it's um, I, I would say that he's slightly less pessimistic, and um, I I tend to think that his later view is easier to defend than his earlier view. So is, would you say, because a lot of people would, would, some people would throw Zapfer into the anti-natalist camp, would you say that perhaps that might be a little bit correct early on, but as he moves through life, he uh, he mellows, but becomes a bit more analytical, and we begin to build this, build more systems? So I think he remained really a pessimist and an anti-natalist, so he, he was much more sort of... Um, <clears throat> His views were much darker than what most people would even imagine. But still, uh, when he tried to argue for his view, he had to weaken a few points. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's perhaps we should postpone uh, the details here because it's it's a little difficult to go into the uh, finer details before we have the broad picture. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, to to open up this broad picture, then I mean, one of the questions that we had down here was was to do with the last Messiah, and we have these uh, these four we could say pillars of that humans use human. Well, I think in a way to say humans would probably be a bit of a problem for Zapfer because we always have to focus on the biology. So human beings, you know, us animals here on this cosmic rock uh, that we use to build meaning so we have the biological the social the autotelic and the metaphysical and um these these all combine but um yeah i mean just what what are your thoughts on this foundation do you think there's any flaws in it i mean what what do you make of these these as uh these four four sort of cornerstones of i guess existential well, meaning 
Okay, so this is the crucial point, and so we could spend a lot of time here. At first, mm -hmm. I would say that it's um, it's very ambitious because it tries to say something about how the human condition is, not just at the time, but uh, at all times. So it, it tries to say something about what necessarily characterizes the human condition. And the way he goes about this is not to have an analytic of Dasein like, like Heidegger does. <clears throat> he's not even aware of uh, Heidegger at this stage. <clears throat> so his approach is much more traditional and uh, very much incompatible with the, the famous uh, French existentialism of Sartre. <laughs> because Sartre, he, he describes existentialism as the view that there is no human nature. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but Sapfe, on the other hand, he tries to formulate a new theory of what human nature is. <clears throat> and so he makes the claim that we have four separate interests, and these interests um, uh, constitute us as human beings. Uh, <clears throat> and this theory is, is very sort of ambitious and bold, and I think it's on the one hand not sufficiently elaborated on so uh it's, it's a big bold theory and he he has some good points but it's not sufficiently developed so it's some some issues are fairly unclear on the other hand it's there are some difficulties uh we could try a quick run through or mm -hmm. what do you think yeah, yeah sure so so first off he starts with biological interests so he basically thinks that we need the nutrition and Nutrition and um, and things like that. So this is something we share with the animals, and, and this is seems roughly right. And uh, he then goes on to claim that we have social interests because um, other human beings matter to us independently of their biological function. So I care about other human beings, even if they do, don't. Support me anyway biologically. Uh, I'm not going to eat or drink them or anything like that. So, so he he claims that uh, mankind has a rep representation of um, the entire species of mankind as a whole, and this separates us from the animals. Some people might disagree with this today, but I, still, it's not really decisive for his theory. Um, what is decisive is the next two uh, interests, so the autotelic interests and the metaphysical interests. <clears throat> and so basically the terminology here comes from aesthetics. So um, Sapfe was very much influenced by uh, some of the older literature in aesthetics that tried to explain why does art and music and things like that matter so much to us if they're useless in some sense. <laughs> Uh, that, that don't give us nutrition or anything biologically. <clears throat> uh, it's not even certain that they always uh, share, have this social function and so on. <clears throat> so Sapfer then said that um, art is typically about things that have value in themselves. <clears throat> so I typically find something pleasurable in itself. <clears throat> So playing guitar, for instance, is not just a means to something else. It's good in itself, roughly. <clears throat> so this is a familiar view that uh, Sapfe extended. And he said that there are many things that can have this value, not just art and music. Uh, mountaineering is a fairly clear case for him. <clears throat> and experiences in nature. <clears throat> and so the problem uh, with Sapfe is that this kind of meaning is only local, so it's only some parts of life that could have this meaning. It's fairly restricted. And he, I think he wants to say that this is because it, it's not self-sufficient. So, for instance, I, I enjoy playing guitar, and Sapfer certainly enjoyed mountaineering. But those things are not self-sufficient. It's not the case that you could have your entire life just consisting of mountaineering or guitar playing, right? So uh, both of them are dependent on other things in, for their existence. <clears throat> and so so Sapfer then wants to say that, well, fine, we have some local meaning in life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's not enough. So he, he makes the claim that uh, we lack a global meaning. <clears throat> 
So uh, he has this distinction here uh, between meaning in life. So he allows some meaning in life, yet he denies meaning of life as a whole. Uh, and he makes the further assumption that life as a whole cannot um, justify itself. So he, he thinks that it's not some kind of valuing itself, it's rather something that needs an external justification. So historically, people might think of God or someone who who who, who had that kind of justification. <clears throat> and and uh, some people don't, don't think that it's, it's credible anymore, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in relation to your own work, I mean, Kierkegaard seems to be somewhat of a little bit of a surprising figure amidst yeah. that worldview, you know, um, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the, the man who had sort of the philosophy of faith. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too well read on Kierkegaard. I struggle with his prose, but, um, he seems surprising to be in that oeuvre because this notion of the problem of beauty, which is a typical Schopenhauerian problem of the world is dreadful, but things are beautiful and music is beautiful to listen to and art we are interested in art the problem of beauty or an animal amidst yeah. pessimism uh so schopenhauer and those those thinkers make sense but kierkegaard not so much so why do why do you think zephyr uh what, you know held him has such a great influence yeah it's not just that zephyr himself was exposed to a sort of christian background <laughs> And that the problems he discussed were um, were much internal to the this tradition, like the problem of evil. How could a good God allow human suffering and evil? It's not just that. Uh, it's also the case that uh, in Sappho's diaries and the, the work he left behind that remains unpublished, uh, he he actually. Um, credits Kierkegaard as a kindred soul. And he seems influenced by some of Kierkegaard's pseudonyms that are rather pessimistic. <clears throat> so Kierkegaard, of course, is known as the melancholic Dane, right? He's not a very happy Christian. Uh, rather, he's, he's a very sort of bleak and melancholic one who's obsessed with uh, topics like despair <clears throat> and suffering. And so this seems to be the Kierkegaard that... Um, Sub appreciated, and so uh, from what we can gather, the, the sources are a little scarce, but uh, Sapphire does have a few references to Kierkegaard, and it, roughly it seems to be that he thought that Sip, S Kierkegaard at least partially got the problem right. So his this interpretation of the human situation seems at least partially right, so he, he, he gets problem that has to do with pessimism, especially um, despair right <clears throat> and melancholy and problems like that um on the other hand his solution uh, is for something very incredible uh, or uh, impossible it's it's just uh, his account of uh, religious belief or faith um is some, something that sub on the one hand sort of dismisses on the other hand he actually buys into it because Kierkegaard famously notoriously interprets religious faith as being absurd <laughs> and paradoxical this is something that uh, Sapphire really embraces right and on the other hand um Kierkegaard notoriously describes the transition to faith the uh conversion to faith as a leap so Kierkegaard uses the Danish term uh, springe, which is translated as the leap. Kierkegaard actually never speaks of a leap of faith. He never speaks of a blind leap of faith. It's uh, the invention of the translators and commentators. Mm -hmm. It's not to be found in Kierkegaard. So, but the thing is that. Um, so sorry, just to stop you there. What is what is what's the difference between springe and leap? What have we got? What okay. of us? What of us English speakers go wrong? No, it's just that. It's basically it doesn't really have to do with the languages. It has to do with the the interpretations and um, commentators. So so um, Kierkegaard basically used the leap or springer for a transition that's not 
deductive when you uh, go from one category to another. So, for instance, when I, I leap from moral consideration to considerations to merely prudential ones, or I, I, I go from discussing, say, a political issue to uh, discussing, let's say, a legal one. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. So these kind of transitions to another category, that's a leap for Kierkegaard. <clears throat> and so he, he's very much aware of the fact that this is not something you can justify deductively, but still it's very important, both normatively and motivationally in human thought. And so at, at present, this is a big issue in, in analytic philosophy because uh, the discussions of uh, normative pluralism really... Um, <clears throat> sharpens this issue. So uh, let's say that you have several different standards, okay, moral ones, prudential ones, legal ones, aesthetic ones, and so on. And how could we at all compare them if we don't have any sort of common ground for comparing them, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so if we lack uh, a common ground, um, then we only have different local standards. We have no global ones. And then uh, the transition from one point of view to another one is just a, a leap. <clears throat> and so um, this looks like a, a transition that's not rational at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but Kirchhoff actually had, has a fairly sophisticated uh, account of how uh, some leaps might be justified after all. And and to uh, to make that case, he has to rule out very sort of uh, relativistic views, right? So he, he basically uh, argues that some views have internal problems. They collapse internally, and that might justify the transition to a new standard. So that's roughly Kierkegaard's view. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Kierkegaard's uh, fairly sophisticated uh, account here got... Um, simplified beyond recognition by some of the commentators and then uh, it got transformed into what is known today as a blind leap of faith. Uh, so, so this it's not is, specifically to do with faith at all, it's to do with that uh, transition between deductive reasoning where there is no basis for deduction. Excellent question. So on the one <laughs> hand, it's, there is a general issue, right? So mm -hmm. Uh, it's the issue we run into every time we make a non uh transition and when we try to enter a new category and we don't have any good justification for it. So we go from one standard to another one. So it's a general problem. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, this problem is particularly sensitive in the sense of, uh, in the case of religious belief or faith. Uh, and the Scandinavians here don't distinguish between belief or faith. <clears throat> And so, uh, so for Kierkegaard, uh, he, he uses the term leap both in the general sense and a specifically religious sense. <clears throat> and uh, Stop actually, uh, he uses leap in, in the religious sense. So he he's suggesting that, oh, religious belief is not just absurd, as Kierkegaard claims, but it also involves some si sort of blind leap of faith. And so, so Sapp uses the Kierkegaardian terms not to defend religious belief, but to attack it, right? So this is what's going on. Um, yeah. Do you think so, Kierkegaard might be kind of sympathetic to Zapfer's view there? I think that it's it's easier to see why um, Zapfer might do this, and a lot of people might sympathize with him. Um, having said that, I think that Kierkegaard is in fairly solid grounds. I, I tried to uh, explain this in my last book. It's it's uh, it's out on Cambridge University Press. So I, I think that Kierkegaard has fairly good reasons for for. Uh, not just re rejecting religious belief. Um, but this is a, a rather complicated issue that has to do with what is known in English as the ethics of belief. So mm -hmm. this basically is the, a discussion of whether we could justify belief uh, without sufficient epistemic evidence. Mm -hmm. And so Kant and Kierkegaard argues that yes, we can, uh, and Sapfe seems to assume no, we cannot. <clears throat> Okay, so for Zapfer, he would say, "Look, this is all very interesting, but your your 
admittance that the transition is or religious belief is absurd is the thing that negates that belief itself because you're admitting it's absurd. So Zapfer, does Zapfer sort of stop? He uses it, but he stops before the transition even takes place and sort of says, we have to stay on this side of the line because anything else is ridiculous. Yes, that's roughly what's going on. There is a slightly more nuanced uh, discussion in uh, his doctoral dissertation, but r roughly, if we can simplify matters slightly, mm -hmm. he's basically saying that we need to distinguish between reality as it is and our wishes and desires and so on, on the other hand. Mm -hmm. And so he, he's accusing religious believers of uh, wishful thinking. <clears throat> So, so basically, that's what Subway is doing. And he, he realizes in the doctoral dissertation that this is a little quick and fast. So, so he has, uh, there are some nuances there. Uh, but since this is not available in English and so on, I think we should wait a little. The good news, though, uh, which... Um, I'm not sure if I'm at liberty to say, so I, this might have to be removed uh, in retrospect. But hmm. uh, something's I coming. Seen, I've seen a full um, a full uh, translation of On the Tragic into English, and oh. the translator says that he has a publishing contract. Okay. We'll leave out Nate. We'll leave out names. I think we might. We'll be okay. But you'll have to let me know if I need to take that out. But that's exciting. That's exciting. Yes, so it could be actually that the both the publisher and the translator would know this to be known, but perhaps they they'll be the ones to decide exactly when and when to announce it, right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. so uh, it, anyway, it's it's a huge work. It's six hundred pages. It's it's a lot of work to translate into English, mm. uh, and it's not even written in Norwegian. You might say it's just as much written in Danish. Uh, there is absolutely no distinction in the literal uh, written language here between the Danish and the Norwegian. <laughs> one. So he's following the old um, 1907 uh, written language, which was shared between Danish and Norwegian. Okay, yeah. that's why it's so difficult to translate. I understand. Okay, so no. just... if if you read Kirkar, it's very easy. <clears throat> uh, but uh, yeah. <clears throat> Just to stay on the Kierkegaard uh, thread, though, because, uh, like I said, I'm not, I'm no expert in Kierkegaard, not at all. But from the little bits I've read, there, and I think this comes up in, might come up in your own papers. There is a, there is what we might consider, or some might consider, a strain of antinatalism in Kierkegaard's thought, where you know, which is yes. surprising for a religious thinker, where he would say, like, your, yeah, your yeah. existence, if you are born, your existence is going to be one of anxiety and fear. Uh, in relation to uh, in relation to yeah. the uncertainty of God, so do you think there is a there is an overlap between the Zapfian antinatalism and the Kierkegaardian antinatalism? Do you think there's a place where they meet? Yes, there is some overlap between the very late Kierkegaard and uh, and Zapfian. So basically, um, I'm a Kierkegaard specialist, but Kierkegaard specialists don't really uh, agree on what happened to the late Kierkegaard. So the the Stand of view is still that he basically went almost mad uh, in his final years. So um, even when Kierkegaard died, his brother, a priest who went on to become a bishop of the Danish church, he said during the funeral that Kierkegaard uh, went mad. And so he was trying to excuse his brother for his violent attack on the Danish state church. <clears throat> and so Kierkegaard was constantly attacking those who, who found it easy to be a Christian and to, to uh, try to try to say that uh, Christianity doesn't involve following Christ. So against those people, Kierkegaard basically said that being a Christian means following Christ, and it's no coincidence that Christ got crucified. So to the extent that you're good and you're a believer who follows Christ, to that very extent, you will end up just like Christ. Mm -hmm. You will end up suffering and being crucified by your fellow man. <clears throat> um, so this is basically what the late Kierkegaard says, and he, he says that life is so bad that you shouldn't have children. 
and you should, shouldn't should even have sex. So he's, the late Kierkegaard is very ascetic, <clears throat> very much against sexuality, and it seems very pessimistic. And also in this final stage, he was influenced by Schopenhauer. <clears throat> and so we still don't know exactly what happened. And 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 basically, uh, almost all Kierkegaard scholars think that Kierkegaard went way too far. <clears throat> <laughs> And so he lost a lot of the nuances he had earlier on. So he was very much engaging in a heavy polemics, a heavy attack on the Danish state church. And he went a little too far, most of us think. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Anyway, um, this is something that sub uh, <coughs> valued, I think. On the one hand, he, he attacking the state church seems like a, a good thing for Sapfe. On the other hand, it exposed how bad Christianity is after all. So he, it, I, but the thing is that whereas most people would say that, oh, Kierkegaard is overly pessimistic, then I think Sapfe would say that, no, basically Kierkegaard is right that human life entails suffering, meaninglessness, and so on, and you shouldn't have children. <clears throat> so, so but the late Kierkegaard and Sapp are both antinatalists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I hate to ask, I'm sure it's a question that comes up in Kierkegaard scholarship. How does Kierkegaard synthesize be fruitful and multiply uh, from Gen- yeah, Genesis? Yeah, Genesis yes. and not having children. Would he say that if you end up in marriage, then it's sort of an un- you're being pulled by something unfortunate. Well, uh, this is something that most Kierkegaard scholars are very uncomfortable with discussing, <laughs> and you know why? What? There's a big work on this. There's a big book in Danish, mm-hmm. and uh, it's not translated. I'm not sure it will ever be translated. And you know why? The book is on anti-Semitism. Uh. From, so by, by, by Kierkegaard. So it's a secondary source. So basically, uh, the Kierkegaard here looks like an antisemit who says that it's only Judaism who is concerned with the goodness of life, having children and stuff like that. So the late Kierkegaard then it really draws a line between uh, Judaism which he thinks is very much um, pro-life and um, not in the sort of American sense, but it's it's anti-pessimistic, mm-hmm. right? And then he separates this from what he describes as New Testament Christianity. Uh, and the late Kierkegaard takes the latter to be very pessimistic. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's the brief answer. So, um, yeah. So this idea of having many children and so on uh, uh, is dismissed by Kierkegaard as not being a really Christian idea as, or, at all. It's only a Jewish uh, idea. I see, I see. That he interprets as being selfish and, and sinful and so on. Um, well, I'm sorry to have found the one uncomfortable Kierkegaard question to ask you. No, it's it's perfectly okay. I, I think if you want to uh, investigate this more, you should... Uh, Talk to Peter Tuvad, who wrote this book uh, about Kierkegaard and antisemitism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Con- a controversial uh, figure? I, I don't think... I, I, I wouldn't say so, but it, it's uh, well known that there's been a, 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 a big controversy in Denmark mm-hmm. uh, involving some of the same names, but not for the same reasons. So I, I, I think it's... I wouldn't say... Um, well... Let's just say that the whole issue of Kierkegaard and anti-Semitism hasn't been sufficiently discussed by scholars, mm-hmm. right? Okay. And um, there is a lot of material in the late Kierkegaard that seems problematic in many ways. It's not too clear how it affects the earlier Kierkegaard. Mm-hmm. And, and we, if you want to, it's possible to do a separate podcast on this. It's a fairly big issue, so yeah. Sure. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, that would be great. But uh, just to, I mean, I guess to jump back, I'm really interested in this thread, Kierkegaard and Zapfer, because it seems one of those cases where 
the small a small disagreement ends up into a large difference. But I guess one big question to begin that discussion on morality, because we've you've sort of given us the foundation here. We've had the the four cornerstones uh, of Zapfian thought. The difference between the two in terms of the absurdism and the leap. So how does a uh, morality and ethics be built from these both these positions do you think the difference between the two is how one has a relationship with suffering and i guess maybe zapfer would say that kick guard and suffering is like you're just being absurd again to consider suffering anything other than just suffering yeah okay so on the one hand there is this deep issue of, of how to handle suffering and i don't think that kick wants to explain it away rather i think uh, he, he thinks that in some sense you should embrace suffering and accept it. Mm. And that seems very demanding, yeah, uh, and somewhat paradoxical. Um, Kirk, or sorry, Subway is not very happy with that. And it really has to do with morality, but not morality in a very narrow sense, but morality in a, a very broad sense that has to do with What's the point of your life? Is it happiness? You die money or is it something else? Uh, so morality in, in antiquity had to do with holistic considerations, not just of lot, lot of different actions and so on, but it has to do with what kind of person you are, what's your virtues and vices, right? It has to do with, um, happiness as, um, the purpose of human existence and things like that. <clears throat> and so if we, Take morality in this uh, very sort of broad classical sense. I think uh, morality is crucial for both Kierkegaard and Sapfe. <clears throat> but it's a little difficult because in order to, to deal with this, you need to consider happiness and prudential issues. <laughs> and also, I think uh, that religious issues enter here. So, so um mm. We could spend a lot of time on this. Uh, it's, 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 it's fairly a complicated area, uh, as, at, at least for Kirkar, um, because he tries to, to sort of sketch some kind of solution here. Sapfi is more sort of, um, well, at least some of his points could be stated fairly briefly. So, so he thinks that in some sense, um, meaninglessness is a fact of life, just as is, moral uh, injustice so there are some problems that cannot be explained away <clears throat> mm -hmm. and because of this we, we have a problem and the problem cannot really be solved by appealing to god or anything like that for subfer <clears throat> so he, he thinks that um uh, we should be sort of um frank or sincere and just state the problems <laughs> and uh, and see that we cannot really solve them and because we cannot solve the problems of meaninglessness and injustice, it's better than to um, to put it brutally to to abolish the human race. <clears throat> mm. yeah. yeah. So once we admit to these problems and admit that all the religious leaps and absurdism is simply that is absurd, and just accept that it's nonsense for Zapfer then the only conclusion would be to wind down the human race. And if our moral duty in the Schopenhauerian sense is to alleviate suffering, then yeah. the end result of that would be just to allow the human race to run its course. Would Zapfer agree with that? Or would he, is there a bit more, I'm assuming there's probably a bit more nuance to that. Or does he simply want the human race to, to die out? Would that be the, the best result for suffering? I think he probably it's committed to the view that um, the best thing would be is if the human race were to disappear. <clears throat> mm. However, there are a, a lot of sort of complicated issues here. And so one has to do with suicide. Uh, and so he is not um, at all happy with the sort of standard objection to pessimism that pessimism favors suicide. Mm -hmm. And so he tries to defend pessimism without uh, recommending suicide or making a suicide overly attractive or ev even a moral duty. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he's never able to really solve this problem. He basically makes different comments of different points in time. 
so he's he makes one note here one comment there and then it's it's not too co developed it's not too coherent <clears throat> uh and and um the, the problem is that he didn't really discuss this in any systematical text he just makes a lot of different comments at different stages right so for instance during the cold war war and and the sorry the cold war <clears throat> uh Sapphire was really in favor of NATO. He was really supporting um, nuclear weapons, um, and he, he thought that we needed them um, to protect ourselves. And then when he was asked about the potential of a, a great nuclear war or the human race being nuked, what was his response? His response was, an island without any inhabitants wouldn't be so bad, would it? Right. So <clears throat> he basically said that if if mankind were wiped out, um, it would be for the better. That was the suggestion uh, or the implication, or <clears throat> yeah. So um, yeah, and this falls from the, his basic assumption. So basically, we have a problem we cannot solve. <clears throat> Um, we cannot get around meaninglessness and injustice, and and uh, Danny thinks that it's better to abolish the human race. <clears throat> so he's pro nuclear as long as we use them. Yeah, it, it wasn't too clear in this context. Uh, I'm politically, it's it's fairly clear, uh, although this is not too no well known. He was belonging to the right wing in Norway. He was uh, in support uh, of uh, NATO very much. And um, and yet, I think that unlike most of his contemporaries, he, he didn't think that the nuclear war was would just be disastrous. <clears throat> mm. uh, I, yeah. And so this is in line with his, his view, his pessimistic view, basically. Um, <clears throat> human life is so bad that perhaps it wouldn't be such a great tragedy if uh, we were nuked. Uh, perhaps uh, also suicide shouldn't be uh, rejected or attacked like it, it's been done in, in, in the past, right? So he, he, he makes different suggestions. It's not perfectly clear, but he, he's, he's basically having more sympathy with, with those who sort of at least allow suicide. And he himself kept a lot of uh, drugs that would make it possible for him to enter, uh, so to, to leave uh, voluntarily. So this is, there is a biography on, on Sapfe by Jürgen Hove. It's called Naked in the Cosmos, so Naked on the Cosmos. And um, it basically uh, describes how Sapfe got drugs, I think it was just morphine, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he thought, Sapfe thought he had a, a lethal dose. And so he, he was not planning to use it in the near foreseeable future. He want, just wanted to keep it just in case life became too unbearable for him. And then uh, he made a shocking discovery several years later on that uh, the dose wasn't big enough. And so uh, his entire life stopped. He was not able to to go on with his daily living or his daily business because he didn't have a sufficient dose of uh, of drugs. <clears throat> and so he then madly uh, tried to get more drugs so that he could have a lethal dose. And only when he got that, he could sort of go on with his regular life. <clears throat> so... His mean his, his personal meaning for life for a long time was riding was was the foundation of which was the fact that he could end his life. Yes, and then when so he found out he couldn't end his life, that's when he really wanted to end his. <laughs> that's kind of. Funny. I, I think it's. It, I don't think he really in, intended suicide in in the, any sort of foreseeable the, way. The catharsis of the op the option being there. Yes, yeah. so it's more like um, someone who's imprisoned, right? Mm -hmm. And so you could sort of up live with being imprisoned if you know that I'm able to escape uh, if if the situation gets much worse, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so this is just how Sapphire thought about life. 
I may endure this for some time if I have this option of exiting mm -hmm. at my own will, right? <clears throat> and so, so, and he truly, uh, there's many things he, he appreciated, like mountaineering, being out in the wilderness, and things like that. And and uh, and he had a lot of sort of great literary interests and gifts and so on. So in many ways, he was a very sort of rich. Um, Richly talented and very sort of uh, well, certainly not a monomanic uh, pessimist, right? Uh, quite the opposite. Um, mm. Yeah, and then lives to be quite old as well, right? Into his ninety. Yeah, 90... yeah, typical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's always the way the the pessimists always live a long long lives. Yeah, I'm not sure why that is. So, <laughs> I guess one question from all of this that we've spoken about is. Um, What's the individual? Well, actually, before that, because Zapfa, I think a lot of people would, who are not antinatalists and are not pessimists might say, well, hang on, I enjoy my life. I have no problems with the body. I, I'm fine yeah. with uh, my body degrading and dying. I'm fine with suffering. I enjoy my life. You know, I, I personally have known plenty of people who are well into their 80s and 90s who are still happy and enjoying their life. Isn't Zapfa making a, an authoritarian error saying that all people would he just say those people are just lying to themselves so basically here he's committed to a fairly paternalistic view right <clears throat> so his theory is not about how different people sort of conceive themselves so he's not a subjectivist here he thinks there is an objective truth that, that you can be mistaken about and this objective truth concerns meaning, not just the subjective experience of meaning, but real meaning out there, <laughs> independently of us, and also um, suffering and injustice that we can be mistaken about. So, so he's basically committed towards a fairly strong view, and he needs a lot of sort of uh, typical philosophical justifications to defend this view, right? <clears throat> And so, so it needs to show that uh, people are mistaken. <clears throat> uh, still, I think he could say that uh, it, it might be in some cases that it's better to just leave people alone with their illusions, right? <clears throat> yeah, most people uh, don't think, know. Most people don't know they're in prison. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So um, I guess for Zapfer as well, there's a question of what what are we to do? Like, are, are we actually to accelerate? You know, the the end of would would there be a pra like almost a practical Zapfian morality of pushing the word out about how awful the world is in relation to that? And I don't know. Uh, theoretically yeah. speaking, a Zapfian position might be to legalize euthanasia clinics and things like that. Is there anything like that, or is this okay, once again so more? More, okay, uh, so abstract. yeah, uh, thanks for asking. So, first, he's not too comfortable with really pushing uh, suicide as a, a duty or anything like that. So, what he's suggesting instead is that it's morally wrong to have children. Mm, okay, so uh, in 1933, in um, The Last Messiah, he, he states very clearly that you should stop having children because. You will only sort of um, add to the misery by by having children. So it will increase uh, injustice and meaninglessness and so on. And 1941, um, he had a weaker view. So in 1941, he had uh, what is sort of an anticipation of the one child child policy of China. <clears throat> So he said that instead of abolishing humanity right now, we should just make sure that every pair uh, only have one children. And so we will quickly sort of um, diminish the number of humans. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't even claim that this is very realistic. He just said that this is um, the best we could expect or something like that. Yeah. So... Yeah. Again, he, he didn't develop this in great detail. <clears throat> yeah. But it, it what it seems clear though is that he thought the best solution was just stop having children. Uh that will solve the problem. 
and then it was not so perfectly clear about suicide mm-hmm. or even nuclear war. <clears throat> but would would death be seen really as like the ultimate gift? Does he have much philosophy on death, or is it just an inevitable? Yeah, he does, and it's it's very paradoxical and and difficult. Um, so on the one hand. <clears throat> He thinks that that is something bad because um, we have projects and even local meaning in life. And our projects are uh, abruptly and and arbitrarily sort of ended by that. And so we might think of a great artist who is creating something and then he's unable to finish his great work just because of health issues. And this is a familiar phenomenon, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, um, so Sopfer thinks that life is that is bad. So he seems to suggest that it would be good to be able to go on living. This is paradoxical. Ha- and here it seems to be abstracting from the problems uh, mentioned before uh, the problems of injustice and meaninglessness. Uh, and uh, also, it's even more complex because when he argues that in order to see that life is meaninglessness, we need that. So that has, is indispensable, he suggests, for uh, seeing that life as a whole is limited. Mm. It's only when we run up against that that we see that um, <clears throat> We cannot go on indifferently, and uh, there is an end to our projects, and life is a limited whole. <clears throat> so he thinks that facing that helps us uh, epistemically. It makes us see life in, in a holistic picture. You get a greater picture by confronting that, he thinks. And he sees that I'm doing this for that and so on. Things are local justifications, but there is no global justification. <clears throat> yeah. mm. yeah. So I hope you don't mind if I ask, has uh, Zapfian philosophy influenced your own your own life, your own outlook? Uh, not too much, but I, I think that, uh, well, on the one hand, there, there, there's certainly a, enough problems in life. So... <laughs> There are problems with, uh, well, moral injustice. There's problems with meaning and, and meaninglessness and suffering and things like that. So suffering is fairly good at describing some of the problems. <clears throat> and I think you need to sort of think through this and to see whether you think it's right or, or not and what's what are good reasons here and what are not. So I think... Sub helps you by provoking you. Uh, he helps you to think through things and to make up your own mind. But unfortunately, his effect then, at, at least here in Norway, seems to be very polarizing. So either people love him <clears throat> and think he's just right, so he he's almost attracts religious believers <clears throat> who, are, who are sort of committed pessimists, believing pessimists, or people just flat out reject him as being overly pessimistic. And the unfortunate thing is that often these people will not argue much for the news. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So we have basically two camps. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add about uh, Zapfer, Kierkegaard, or the discussion we've been having uh, that you, you feel is key to, to add in? I think that Sufi is right to emphasize problems of suffering and evil and so on. I think it, this is also uh, relevant for ongoing debates uh, because perhaps the greatest problem with religious belief is the problem of evil. It's it's one of the problems that won't go away. So even if you're somewhat sympathetic to religious belief and think there's a, a lot of important work being done by theologians and philosophers and so on, there are also some serious problems uh it's not easy to solve <clears throat> and i think also that in many ways um okay i think first you might say that sub is, is great by combining some of the continental and analytic philosophy <clears throat> and i think this is the way to go really i think the whole divide is unfortunate and so uh, sub is really anticipating what 
came later in the 1970s and so on, when analytic philosophers became uh, interested in the meaning of life and issues like that. So, in, in uh, so basically during uh, World War II, he wrote in an analytic manner uh, and discussed the, uh, the meaning of life. So he was doing this 30 years before um, Nagel and others, right? <clears throat> So that's a good thing. Another uh, good thing is that he he anticipates a lot of the discussions we're having today about uh, antinatalism and pessimism. And so the view he, he sketches is um, not identical, but similar to the view of Benatar and others who think there is a specific problem with cosmic meaning. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Are you currently working on any more Zapfa or is uh... at the moment I'm, I'm working in ethics, so I, I think uh, there's a deep problem here having to do with uh, the relation between morality and um, happiness, you might say, or the relation between morality and uh, prudence, because uh, I think we should assume that. Um, Prudence uh, seeks aims at happiness. So personal happiness is something that generates prudential reasons for, for action, right? And so uh, the problem I'm working on now, which also concerns self, is how to uh, make morality coherent with uh, personal happiness and prudential striving for prudential happiness. So. The, the problem is, right, that by doing morally good, you could end up being miserable and so on. <laughs> mm. And so it, it's not clear at all that morality um, is coherent with self-interest. So so that's a big, big issue. Do you, I mean, just as an aside, do you think happiness is, is actually something worth going for? Just because you, but because I, I only say that because I just think there's a, there's a cult, there's a modern cult of happiness, right, where it becomes the, the ultimate, the ultimate aim of all things is just to pleasure yeah. and happiness, right? I mean, I don't think it's always the best, yeah. the best personal teleology. That's not to say you have to be a pessimist yeah, yeah. and unhappy, though. So, yes and no. I, I don't think that happiness is so important uh, necessarily, but it really boils down to what you mean by happiness, and and if you <laughs> just mean by that that whatever makes your uh, life better than it would have otherwise been or something like that. So you might think of it as, as a good, right? <clears throat> that um, makes life perhaps justifiable or, or acceptable or at least better than it would otherwise have been. Then I think that happiness is a is crucial, actually, even though its relation to morality is, is a little difficult to, to pin down. Um, so I, I'm not saying that uh, we should think of happiness just in, in subjective terms. Uh, I, I actually think we could be mistaken about our own happiness. And I also think there are moral restrictions on happiness. <clears throat> and so I, I'm, I think that there is a big problem here. Uh, it doesn't really have to do with just feeling happy. <laughs> Being happy is not just the same as feeling happy. <clears throat> mm. yeah. Okay, okay. Well, um. You said uh, your book is via Cambridge University Press. Um, yeah. Is there anywhere else we can find your other work? Uh, okay, so I, I tried to upload most of the stuff on academia, and also you find a lot of my papers on Phil Papers. Mm -hmm. And if you don't find something, you might send me an email. Sometimes I'm, I'm not at liberty to upload everything, and and so, uh, but uh, still often it's uh, allowable to share some stuff in private yeah okay. and so um yeah but I, i'm not at liberty of course to share entire book manuscripts and things like that uh yeah okay but well, i am yeah I, I think basically i'm i'm seeing uh, ethics in a classical sense as being very much uh, about what is called existential issues after kirchhoff <clears throat> So I'm really trying to approach ethics uh, existentially and all, and vice versa, you might say, to approach existential philosophy ethically. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So, okay. yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah.
Are you currently writing a book on on this ethics, or is it? Yeah, I'm there? doing a new book now on uh, morality and self interest. So um, it has to do with uh, this classical problem of uh, morality not uh, coinciding or harmonizing with um, happiness and prudence. That's a classical issue. And if we go back to a discussion we just had, we could sort of uh, restate the problem and say that. The problem is how to compare moral standards and prudential standards. And so if we have separate standards, how could we compare them and even rank them? We don't have any third standard that allows us to to rank them, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, this is a, a decisive issue because if we cannot solve this issue, then... Uh, we cannot really say whether uh, morality should override self-interest or vice versa. <clears throat> uh, and so uh, we need to solve this issue uh, concerning um, normative pluralism um, in order to, to make any progress. And uh, in the past, it was uh, described um, roughly as the dualism of practical reason. So mm -hmm. that's the term from Sidgwick, right? So Sidgwick uh, focused only on morality and self-interest, but there, uh, you can generalize this, and you could say that for any kind of good or any kind of reason, you will have this problem as long as you introduce several different standards, right? <clears throat> so if we have legal standards, aesthetical ones, and so on, we could get uh, all kinds of issues having to do with transitions between the standards and also with uh, comparisons and, and rankings of the standards right <clears throat> and I can, so I can is, see uh, there why there might be a foundation of Kierkegaard in the leap as well the deduction between the different standards of ethics yeah so I, I find Kierkegaard to be quite good and defensible here I don't think it's any blind leap of fit at all so uh, <laughs> yeah uh, but it's it's fairly closely connected to some contemporary debates, yeah, and um, also connected to, to some big traditional issues, so um, yeah, I'm also, yeah, as you probably realize, I'm, I'm also interested in the philosophy of religion, so I, I think it's very, a very rich and rewarding field, whether you are a believer or not, I don't think it, it matters all that much always, um, yeah, and, and by the way, uh, I think that Sapfe sometimes made the suggestion that pessimism was not just about a lack of belief religiously. Mm -hmm. Rather, pessimism is about hopelessness. <clears throat> and so you could restate and re sort of re-describe the problem in terms of hope. Uh, and you could do that with religious um, thinking as well. So religion doesn't just have to do with beliefs. It, it has to do with hope and despair. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and then the whole sort of terminology, right, with the atheists and theists and so on, it, it breaks down. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. You so don't. You don't find the whole the terminology atheists... has to do with yeah. belief, not not hope. That seems like a better heuristic, more productive. Yeah, and anyway, I, I, sometimes I think that hope matters more to us than, than belief, right? In many cases, I mean, it, we need not affirm belief in order to, to go on existing. What we need in many cases is uh, some kind of hope that can be justified. <laughs> mm. And so typically we're facing uncertainty, and in, in, in face of uncertainty, what do you need? Well, hope is certainly one of the best things. Uh, we could have in, in such situations, right? Yeah. And this and this is the discussions you're tackling in your the book to be published. Uh to be honest, it, it's yet another project. I, I've written some papers on it, and, and I hope to do a, a more work on this in the future. Yeah, um, but there's there's a lot of um, interesting work going on these days on the moral psychology of hope. Uh, so I've written. I guess five to ten papers on, on um, hope and despair, 
and I hope to develop this in the future into a more systematic contemporary account of the importance of hope and despair. And it, it that has to do mainly with Kierkegaard, but more about the contemporary relevance of this. And unlike uh, contemporary philosophers who mainly focus on the nature of hope, that want to say that, oh, hope consists of belief and desire and blah, blah, blah. I think the main issue is whether hope is justified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I'll be sure to put all the links for your your work and also the book on Kierkegaard in the description below. But I feel we've uh, we've covered a good amount of Zapfer and Kierkegaard. So, Rua Fremstedar. It's been a great conversation. Thanks very much. So thanks, James. Yeah.